to the subset of R n, let's say x is the size of uh, the size of x is capital N, and for all epsilon between zero and a half, there exists the linear map a pi, which is n by n. M is one over epsilon squared log n, such that for all x y in capital X. If you look at pi x minus pi y, so x gets sent to pi x. So here you should think, uh, right? So this think about m as being much less than little n. We're we're trying to do dimensionality reduction. If you map by pi, then that's at most one plus epsilon x minus y, and it's at least one minus epsilon. And then we had something called distributional JL. Which said that for all epsilon delta in 0 half, there exists a distribution over matrices. So this is a probability distribution over matrices, such that for all x of unit norm, probability over pi drawn from this distribution of this pi x delta norm squared minus 1 bigger than epsilon is at most delta. And last time we saw that distributional JL implies JL if you set delta to be 1 over capital N choose 2, the union bound over all the normalized difference vectors. Just so we're clear, you know, why is that, you know, why is this similar? This basically means that pi preserved the norm of x, right? Because what we want what we want is that pi x has roughly the same norm as x does. Right? That's what we want. And then I squared both sides. And then I subtracted x squared from both sides. But x squared is 1. So this is the same thing as saying, um, and, and basically 1 plus epsilon squared is 1 plus 2 epsilon plus epsilon squared, which is basically the same thing as 1 plus 2 epsilon, right, if epsilon is small. So this thing is really the same thing as saying pi x L2 norm squared minus 1 is less than 2 epsilon, right? Roughly 2 epsilon, 2 epsilon plus epsilon squared, something. Plus epsilon squared, but that doesn't matter as much. So, <coughs> right, this is just saying that pi is preserving the norm of x. And if you preserve the unit norm vectors, you preserve all the vectors. You, you know, if, if this is true for unit norm vectors, it's true for any vector because pi is a linear map. Okay? Good. So, really, it boils down to proving distributional jail. So I'll say a little bit about the history, and then I'll say what I'll actually prove. So in the original J Johnson and Lindenstrauss paper from 84, this is how they did it. They proved distributional JL, and then they got JL. And <coughs> you know what was the pi that they used? right? So the pi that they used was, oh, and I should say, I didn't say what M was. Here, m is O of 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta. So what's the, what's the pi they used, or the distribution d epsilon delta they used? What they did was they said, the linear map, think of it as like the product of two matrices. Okay, so we're going to, the way pi x is going to be, you know, m times p times x. Okay, so m and p are two matrices. What's p? p is a random rotation matrix. So you're going to take your, your vector and just randomly rotate it, uniformly at random, take, take a uniformly random rotation. And then p, p is a silly matrix. It just, preser it just projects to the first m coordinates. Okay? So 
Um, <coughs> that was their, that was their, uh, their, dis their distributional JL. Okay, and they proved that it works if you put, if you pick the M to be something like this. Okay. Good. Um, right, and the, and the basic idea is. Uh, if you take a ran so if you take a if you take a fixed vector x and you perform a random rotation, what do you have? You have a random point on the sphere, right? And basically, it came down to it basically came down to proving that a random point on the sphere, uh, the squared mass in its first m coordinates is tightly concentrated. Okay. So I'm not going to prove I'm not going to prove um, the JL way the, the way that uh, the original JL paper did. But I just wanted to let you know how they did it. Uh, after that, there have been several works that have come up with other distributions, um, or even reanalyzed re the same JL distribution. So there's a paper by Das Gupta and Gupta that gave another analysis of the original JL distribution, random rotation. Uh, otherwise, there were papers Indic Motwani, Akliopdas, uh, Ariaga Vimpala. There were several other papers that. So one, th one, one slightly annoying thing about implementing this random rotation idea is um, the entries of a random rotation matrix are not independent, right? What's a rotation matrix? Basically, the columns are orthonormal. So there's some dependency there. So I mean, one way to get a random rotation matrix is pick a random Gaussian matrix and ran run Gram-Schmidt on it, OK? But, um, <coughs> but that's some, there's some overhead to doing that. But what, what some of these other papers did that I just mentioned is they just took a matrix with IID entries. Okay, so just pick a matrix that has independent Gaussians as its entries, or independent plus minus ones as its entries. Okay, um, so that's what I'm going to show you. So we're going to analyze today. We'll show uh, distributional JL. Distributional JL for pi ij being a random sign, sigma ij over root m. Okay. And the way we're going to prove it is it turns out that it's just a corollary of a certain concentration inequality. So uh, we've been using concentration inequalities, Bernstein, Chernoff, et cetera. There's one that handles exactly the situation, and it's a theorem due to Hansen and Wright, which will prove 1971, which says the following. Let A be a matrix which is real and symmetric. And sigma 1 up to sigma n are independent Rademachers. Rademacher just means plus minus 1. Then for all lambda bigger than 0, the probability over sigma that um, sigma transpose a sigma minus the expectation of sigma transpose a sigma is bigger than lambda is at most e to the minus some constant lambda squared over the Frobenius norm of a squared plus e to the minus some constant over the operator norm of a. Right, so remember Frobenius norm of a matrix is the sum of overall entries. Basically, treat the, t treat the matrix as a vector and take its L2 norm. That's Frobenius norm. And the operator norm <coughs> well, for a real symmetric matrix, it's the sup overall x of unit norm of x transpose ax. Absolute value. Okay. 
So also the matrices A we're going to look at are, oh, um, right. So actually, the lo so this, this, this means for symmetric matrix, this just means the absolute value of the largest eigenvalue. What's the, mag what's the largest magnitude of an eigenvalue? That's, the, that's what the operator norm means. So questions about the theorem statement? Okay, so just um, just so we're on the same page, you know, now that you're tail bound, tail -bound experts, give, if, if Hansen Wright is, is uh, assuming that Hansen Wright is true, right? Call this call this random variable here z. What's the p norm? Give me a bound of the on the p norm of z. If I ask you, give me a bound on the p norm of z. What is it? Right, this is, I guess, P set one, problem one. Do people remember this? Something that looks like this, at least? Right, so you have e to the minus lambda squared over variance plus e to the minus lambda, there's a lambda here, over some other parameter, right? So this is a mixed Gaussian and exponential tail, which means every P norm is bounded by Frobenius norm times root P plus operator norm times P up to a constant. Okay, so this is a, this statement is also a bound on all the p norms. Okay, so <clears throat> we're going to prove Hansen right today. Okay, but before we prove Hansen right, um, I want us to show I want to show you that DJL basically follows immediately from Hansen right. So proof of DJL. Using Hansen right. So what do we want? We want we want that thing, right? We want to show that. Well, let's look at this thing. So pi x L two norm squared, right? That's the thing that we want to understand. Okay. Um, this is equal to some say R goes from so there's a one over M, right? Because it's chi J is a random sign over root M. One over M, some R goes from one to M, uh, and then some uh, I goes from one to N of sigma R I X I squared, right? This is the I. This is the rth entry of pi x. So the L2 norm squared, well, over root m. So the L2 norm, ah, yeah. This is the ith entry over of pi, the rth entry of pi x over root m. When we square it, we get a 1 over m, and then we sum over all entries. So if you expand this, this is equal to 1 over m, sum over r from 1 to m, sum over ij. Um, xi, well, let me, let me bring the 1 over m here and just make it a little clearer. xi, xj over m, sigma ri, sigma rj. OK? So <coughs> one way to view this is, is as a quadratic form where, the where x is the vector. Namely, this is x transpose pi transpose pi x. Right? But another way to view this is as a quadratic form where sigma is the vector. Right? So this is, this is equal to sigma transpose some matrix sigma. Right? Where by sigma, I just mean an mn dimensional vector that has sigma 1, 1 up to sigma 1, n, sigma 2, 1 up to sigma 2, n, et cetera. So what's that matrix that goes in there? In fact, you can verify this yourself. Pi x L2 norm squared is nothing other than what I'll call AX, A sub X sigma L2 norm squared, 
which is a sigma transpose AX transpose AX sigma, right? Where AX some, looks something like 1 over root M times, and then this huge vector, that looks, huge matrix looks like this. This has MN columns, and it has M rows. And here, we write down X transpose. And then this is the first row. And then the next row, we write down X transpose. And then here, we write down X transpose. Right, so plus minus one, random sign. The Rademacher means random sign. Right, so if you look at this, if you look at AX sigma as a vector, what does AX sigma have as its, as its entry? The first entry is X dotted with the, ran, with, the, with the first row of pi. The next entry is X dotted with the second row of pi. X dotted with et cetera, right? So this is exactly, this squared and this squared are exactly the same thing. Okay. In fact, I guess, forget about, the forget about the norms. I think these are just the same vector. Okay, pi x is the same vector as ax sigma. Right? Does that make sense? So Hansen Wright just tells us, right? The, and notice, you know, the problem, so, you know, Hansen Wright just tells us the probability over pi that pi x squared minus the expectation of pi x squared which in this case is just one, right? The probability that this is bigger than epsilon, well, that's just equal to the probability over sigma of sigma transpose AX transpose AX sigma minus the expectation of that thingy is bigger than epsilon. Right, so this is our matrix. This is Hansen Wright with A being AX transpose AX. Right? Does that make sense? You look, uh, look you're curious about something? Here? So all I'm saying, I guess, all, what I'm really saying is, Notice that pi x is actually the same thing as a x sigma. Yeah, so we're looking at what's the probability that pi x squared deviates from its expectation. But that's exact, but pi x squared is the same thing as this, as a x sigma squared. So these are, this are actually exactly the same quantity. So we're just asking what's the probability that this deviates from its expectation. But Where, here? Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this, yeah, exactly. This is AX transpose AX. So I guess all I was saying here was, if you expand this out, this is a quadratic form. This is viewing it as a quadratic form where X is the vector. But really, you can view it as a quadratic form where sigma is the vector. And then the question is, what's the matrix of that quadratic form? And the matrix is exactly AX transpose AX. So now we just do Hanson right. Right, so AX transpose AX, it's a block diagonal matrix. It looks something like this. 1 over M times XX transpose, XX transpose, XX transpose. That's what AX transpose AX looks like. Okay. So let's bound these Frobenius and operator norms. The Frobenius norm, let's just call this matrix, you know, A. The Frobenius norm of A squared, right? So remember, XX the ijth entry of xx transpose is just xi xj, right? So the Frobenius norm squared, well, it's the sum of the squares 
The Frobenius norm squared is the sum of the squares of all the entries. So we have a 1 over m that gets squared. And then we can just sum up the squares of all the entries of these separately. But each one, they're all the same. So there are m of them. So times m times the Frobenius norm squared of xx transpose. Right, that's equal to 1 over m times a sum over ij of xi uh, squared xj squared, which is equal to 1 over m times a sum of xi squared squared, but that's just 1. So this is equal to 1 over m. Okay, so the Fermini's norm squared is exactly 1 over m. So now the operator norm. Whenever you have a block diagonal matrix, this is some linear algebra, all the eigenvalues are just the eigenvalues of each block. Right? So um, the, largest, the largest eigenvalue is just the largest eigenvalue of any block, but all the blocks are the same. So <coughs> this is equal to uh, 1 over m times the largest eigenvalue of xx transpose. XX transpose is, you know, I can tell you what the eigenvalues are. It's a rank one matrix, right? XX transpose has one eigenvector with a non-zero eigenvalue, which is the vector x. And then, and then uh, all the rest of the eigenvectors have eigenvalue zero, right? So um, this is, so, so uh, you know, XX transpose times its eigenvector x is equal to x squared times x, which is equal to x. So the, eigen, the non-zero eigenvalue is 1. Right? So this here is 1. This is equal to 1 over m. OK? We're OK? So I mean, this is you know, nothing too crazy going on here. So this implies all now by Hansen Wright that the probability that pi x L2 norm squared minus 1 is bigger than epsilon is at most e to the minus some constant lambda squared over m plus e to the minus some constant lambda over m. <laughs> so set m to be bigger than something like. Um, C times the max. Oh, there's no, there's no lambda with epsilon. So m has to be at least 1 over epsilon squared log 1 over delta, and it also has to be at least 1 over epsilon log 1 over delta. And then both of these things will just give you e to the minus log 1 over delta. e to the minus log 1 over delta is delta. I'm sorry? m on the numerator? Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Good point. Now it makes more sense. So that's that's it. It's pretty simple. Of course, the all the work really is in proving Hanson right. Right? I just assumed Hanson right. So any questions about anything? Otherwise, we're going to prove Hanson right. Okay. So. <coughs> Before I prove Hansen right, I want to make sure we have some uh, things settled. 
OK, so remember our definition. This was on your PSET, but so this should look very familiar to you. Uh, if you have a random variable x, the LP norm of x is the expectation of x to the p to the 1 over p. Right? That was, I mean, you've seen this before. Um, the theorem, this is Minkowski. This thing is actually is a norm. Okay, so in other words, um, you know, basically what I want to be able to use are things like triangle inequality and and uh, linear. So let me, let me just write what I want to say. So x plus y LP norm is at most x LP norm plus y LP norm. And let me put let me put actually constants here. So if you have scalars. Ax plus by, it's at most Ax plus by. Um, I also want to use, I'm not going to prove it, but I'll just assert it. There's something called Jensen's inequality, okay, which says that um, f is a convex function implies um, <coughs> that f of the expectation of x is at most the expectation f of x. I guess, yeah. so uh, we're going to use this a bit. Okay. And claim, oh, and I should say is a norm for p least one. Claim one less than or equal to p less than q less than infinity implies that the p norm is at most the q norm. I'll leave this to you as an exercise. This follows from Jensen's inequality. You basically define, you define f of x to be the absolute value of x raised to the q over p, and then apply Jensen. And <coughs> um, also, uh, definition is so this uh, just the standard normal distribution, the PDF. PDF of this thing is, um, I guess, 1 over square root of 2 pi e to the minus uh, x squared over 2. Yeah. <coughs> um, and the last thing I'm going to write down on this fact board before I actually start doing real stuff is <coughs> So you can find this calculation pretty much anywhere on the internet. If you have g is a standard normal random variable, that implies that the expectation of g to the p is equal to 0 if p is odd. Otherwise, it's equal to p minus 1 times p minus 3 times all the way down to 1, which is at most uh, square root p to the p, if p is even. Right. This is at most square root p to the p because each of, these, each of these numbers is less than p, and there are, not strictly less than, and there are p over, less than p, or, at most p over 2 of them, right? Or there are p over 2 of them. So in other words, the p norm of a Gaussian is at most root p. Which makes sense because, I mean, this is related to p set 1, problem 1, <coughs> right? So that's why I said, if you look at this, this is just Gaussian decay with a particular variance. So the p norm is root p, just like a Gaussian, root p times the standard deviation. OK, good. So now let's prove Hansen right. Um, 
So Hansen Wright proof ingredients. I'll list them here, and then I'll tell you what they mean one by one, and then prove them. So one is called Kinchin's inequality. Two is something called decoupling. And three is something like Rudelson's square root trick. So if you remember lecture one, I mean, maybe it was a long time ago, and it looked scary then, but it's going to look less scary because you're going to see it again and again. Okay, So this is going to enter your toolkit. It's going to be at your fingertips. So you remember when we proved Bernstein's inequality uh, in lecture one, we bounded a p norm in terms of its own square root. So we're going to do something like that here. Okay, But before we get there, we need to prove some other things. Okay, okay so. So uh, lemma, Kinchin. So let's prove Kinchin first. Where is he from? Like, where would he grow up? Kinchin? Oh, it's his name. Uh, I don't know if he's Russian or if I'm making that up. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually, I don't know much about his life. I don't know anything about his life. Um, actually, we're only gonna I'm only going to write down one side of Kinchin. Kinchin is actually a two-sided uh, inequality. But um, what Kinchin says is, for all x in Rn, and for all p bigger than or equal to 1, if you look at the p norm of uh, some sigma i x i this thing is at most up to a constant root p times the norm of x this is l21 the other side of kinchin is that not only is it at at most root p times the norm of x it's also at least some other thing okay so there's, there's also a lower bound which we will we're not going to care about that okay so right what does this tell you Going, remember, because of pset one, now you know if you pr if you prove bounds on p norms, you also get tail bounds. So it says that for all lambda, the probability that this sum is bigger than lambda in absolute value is at most e to the minus lambda squared over the square norm of x, right? Because this kind of tail bound and that this kind of moment bound and that kind of tail bound are equivalent by pset one problem one. So let's just prove Kinchin. First of all, I claim that it suffices to only prove this inequality for even integer p. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to just prove it for even integer p. But why does that suffice? And use that claim, right? If p is less than q, then the LP norm is at most the LQ norm. So let me just spoil it. So suppose there was a you suppose you wanted to bound some LP norm of this thingy where P is bigger than one. P is at least one. But P maybe it is not an even integer. Just round it up to the closest Q, which is an even integer. Right? That'll at most double P. There's always an even integer nearby. So then what you'll get is oh, this is P norm, by the way. So then what you'll get is the P norm is at most the q norm, where q is this even integer, which is at most root q times the LT norm. But q and p are almost are different by at most a factor of two. So basically that's the same thing as root p times the LT norm. So OK, so we can just prove this thing for even integers, and it implies it for all p at the, at the loss of a constant factor. So <laughs> let's look at this thing. So the LP norm. is, to the p anyway, is equal to the expectation 
of sum of sigma i xi to the p. Okay. So you can expand this thing out to the p, and you'll get like a sum of a bunch of a bunch of uh, indices, you know, i1 up to ip. Um, the product of the xij's where j goes from 1 to p times the expectation of the product of the sigma ij's where j goes from 1 to p. Right, I just expanded out this power to the p. Right. The reason I wanted p to be an even integer is technically, technically the definition of p norm would make me put an absolute value here, right? That's the definition of p norm. The p norm is an absolute, absolute expectation of the absolute value of x to the p or whatever p. But if p is an even integer, then raising something to the raising the absolute value to the p of power is the same as raising the, it itself to the p of power. So that's why I wanted p to be an even integer. So without loss of generality, p is an even integer. But now look at this thing. Some of these sigma ij's are the same. Sigma i1 might happen to equal sigma i7. Some of these sigmas are the same. So really, if you look at the distinct indices that appear here, you'll have sigma of some index to some power times a uh, sigma of another index to some power, sigma another index to some power. Okay. You see what I mean? This thing really, you can really view this thing as the expectation of you know sigma r1 to the d1, uh, sigma r2 to the d2, where I just grouped together sigmas that had the same index. What is the expectation of this thing? What is the expectation of this product of powers of sigmas? Sigma is a random sign, right? Sigma i is a random sign. It's either one or zero, right? Whenever d, whenever di is even, a random sign to an even power is just one. First of all, these are independent. So I should have said these are independent Lautenbachers. So this thing is equal to the product of the expectation, by independence, it's equal to the product of the expectation of sigma rj to the dj, right? Now, <laughs> If dj is even, negative 1 to an even power is 1, that gives you a 1. If dj is odd, you get a 0, right? So if any of the dj's is odd, you get a 0. Otherwise, if they're all even, you get a 1, right? So this expectation is a sum of product of xij's either, times either 1 or 0. Meanwhile, Let's look at a Gaussian, sum of gi xi to the p to the p, right? Again, you can take this and raise it to the p, and you get a similar thing. You get that this thing is equal to a sum of product of xij's times a product of expectation grj to the dj. You get, a, you get basically the sigmas become g's, right? What happens if, if any of these dj's is odd? You get zero again. A Gaussian to an odd power, a Gaussian to an odd power has expectation zero. What happens if you raise it to an even power? You get something. But that something is always at least as big as one. Right? So <clears throat> notice, basically, for for a, for a monomial to survive, in both cases, all the powers have to be even. If all the powers are even, then all the distinct x indices are getting raised to even powers, which means all of these guys are non, which means that all of these guys are non-negative. So you're summing a bunch of things that look like a non-negative number times one. Here you're summing a bunch of things with, which look like a non-negative number times something which is at least one. Because in the Gaussian case, if you raise it to larger powers, you get even larger numbers than one. Right? You get this thing. So what that tells you is that this case is actually strictly less than or equal to the Gaussian case. Right? 
But Gaussians have this magic property that if you sum up independent Gaussians, you get back a Gaussian whose variance is the sum of the squares of the coefficients. So this sum here is just a Gaussian whose variance is the L2 norm squared of x. But we know what the p-norm of a Gaussian is. The p-norm of a Gaussian is root p to the p. right? So because you're scaling it by the L2 norm of x, root p to the p times the L2 norm to the p. Okay, so that's it. That's the end. Questions? So basically you can prove Kinchin just by saying this thing is dominated by the Gaussian case. So now we need to prove the next thing, which is decoupling. So the problem with Kinchin is Kinchin bounds p-norms of linear forms, right? Sigma dot a vector. Hansen Wright is a quadratic form, sigma transpose a sigma. So we want to be able to reduce the quadratic form case to the linear form case, right? And that's what decoupling is going to do for us. Yeah, question? Equality? You mean this? It's an inequality because just look at this, look at, do a comparison monomial by monomial, right? The monomials that survive here, you have some non negative number times one. No, no, this is just an, there's no, there's, there's, I don't need anything here. This is, this is less than or equal to that. Right? I'm just comparing, I'm just expanding this out monomial by monomial, and I'm expanding this out monomial by monomial. And I'm saying the monomials that have odd powers are zero for both of them. The monomials that have even powers, here you get some number times one. Here you get that same number, that same non negative number, times something which is at least one. Right? You have even powers. So some of, some of these powers might be four. The expectation of a Gaussian to the fourth power is three, which is even bigger than one. Right? So the, the Gaussian even power, the Gaussian even moments are always at least one. They can even be bigger. Right? So term by term, this thing dominates this thing. And then we just say, here, this is just a sum of independent Gaussians. A sum of independent Gaussians is a Gaussian. Right? It's a Gaussian whose variance is the sum of the squared coefficients, or the sum of the variances of the individual Gaussians. But we so so then this thing is just a Gaussian, but we know what the p-norm of a Gaussian is, or the p-th moment of a Gaussian is. The p-th moment of a Gaussian is that. It's at most root p to the p. So therefore, the p-norm of this thing is at most the p the p-th moment of this thing is at most root p to the p. Does that make sense? So, so good. We 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 took care of Kinchin. Let's let's do decoupling. There's a book on decoupling, uh, De La Vega and Kim Kim, I believe. I'll fix it in the lecture notes uh, if I spell these names wrong. Okay. So what this says is, um, let's say that A being AIJ is an n by n matrix real matrix, and then sigma 1 up to sigma n and sigma 1 prime up to sigma n prime are 
independent Rademachers, plus minus ones. Then it says for all p bigger than or equal to 1, if you look at the sum of i not equal to j, a i j sigma i sigma j, right? So this this is just sigma transpose a sigma, right? Because I have i not equal to j, I deleted the diagonals, but the diagonals are exactly the expectation. So it says that if you look at the p norm of this random variable, right? This is exactly the p norm of like this is exactly what we care about in Hanson Wright. The p norm of this, right? The p norm of this random variable is at most four times the p norm of this random variable. So this thing right here is sigma transpose A sigma prime. Okay? That's the that's decoupling. Right, so you can you can view this as um, sum of, to put it in that notation, sum over i of sigma i a sigma prime i, right? That's exactly what we handled with Kinchin, right? Kinchin, Kinchin says if you give me a linear form, I can bound its p-norms. If you condition on sigma prime, right, sigma prime is, a, is some random sign vector independent of sigma. Once you condition on sigma prime, a sigma prime is just some vector. So this is exactly a linear form in the Kinchin style. So you can apply Kinchin to this thing. So that when we so that's how we're going to prove Hansen right. That's why we're doing decoupling, right? Because this lets us reduce to Kinchin. Of course, in Kinchin, this is Kinchin right here. This is Kinchin. We're going to end up with the norm of a sigma prime on the right hand side. But a sigma prime is a random vector, so the, that norm is a random variable itself. So then we're going to have to bound it. And then we're going to end up using the square root trick to do that. So we're going to see soon how to complete the proof. But for now, let's prove decoupling. So any questions about the statement of decoupling? Does it make sense? <sighs> OK. So let's prove this. In the proof, we're going to do the following. Let Eta one up to eta n be independent Bernoulli one half random variables. By that I mean it's a it's a coin flip. Eta i is one with probability a half and zero with probability a half. This implies that. Sum i not equal to j, a i j, sigma i sigma j is equal to four times the expectation over eta, sum over i not equal to j, a i j, sigma i sigma j, eta i, eta one minus uh, one minus eta j. Right, because expectation, since i is not equal to j, these two random variables are independent. So the expectation of their product is just the product of their expectations. But what's the expectation of a to i? It's a half. What's the expectation of 1 minus a to j? It's also a half. So the expectation of their product is a quarter. But I multiplied by 4. So all I, all I did was I multiplied by 1. Okay? And then now what I do is I apply Jensen's inequality which says that if I have f of a convex function, remember the p norm is the expectation of the p, of the absolute value of the p. If I have, if I have 
f of a, f, if I have a convex function of an expectation, that's at most expectation of a convex function, which lets me take this expectation and pull it outside. Okay. So um, just so that things don't get confusing, let me write this as by p norm, I really mean LP of sigma. What, I, what, I, what do I mean by that? In the definition of p norm, it's an expectation. But expectation over what? So I'm just being explicit about that. I'm saying I'm taking, I'm taking that expectation over sigma. So I'm taking p norm with respect to sigma. Okay, so LP sigma just means I'm taking p norm with respect to sigma. So this thing is, is p norm with respect to sigma. And what I'm saying is this expectation over eta can be brought outside. So by Jensen, that thing is at most 4 times sum over i not equal to j, aij sigma i sigma j, eta i 1 minus eta j, lp sigma and eta. Now the randomness is over both. Okay. So now what do I say? So we're going to we're going to use an averaging argument. What's an LP norm? An LP norm is just some average, right? It's some expectation. So there has to be an eta, there has to be a fixed vector eta. Eta is a zero one vector, right? It's a random zero one vector where each entry is one with probability of half and zero with probability of half. And what this number is, is the expectation over eta, right? I can write this as uh, expectation over eta of the expectation over sigma of something to the p to the one over p. So this number, or there's a four here. This number is the expectation over eta of something, right? It's the average over eta of something. So there must be a fixed vector eta prime, a fixed zero one vector eta prime, which is at least as much as the expectation, right? So this thing is at most four times uh, the p norm of some i not equal to j, aij, sigma i, sigma j, eta prime i, eta prime, or 1 minus eta prime j, lp sigma, now the randomness is only over sigma, for some fixed eta prime in 0, 1 to the n. So this thing is equal to now 4 times sum of i in s, sum of j not in s, a i j sigma i sigma j lp eta, where s is the set of indices i such that eta prime i is equal to 1. But now notice in this random variable, if I just replace, so for the j's not an s, if I just replace sigma j with sigma j prime, then I get exactly the same distribution. Right? So this thing is equal to 4 times some i and s, some j not an s of aij 
uh, sigma i sigma prime j. So this is LP over sigma s and sigma prime s bar. Okay. So these these two random these two random variables, this random variable and that random variable, have exactly the same distribution. Right. So their p norms are the same. And now we're basically done, right? So there's one more step. Questions? Yeah, so that, so that was the first thing I said, which was just proving it for p and even integer is without loss of generality. Because if our number is not even, if it's not an even integer, then take p and round it up to q, such that q is the closest even integer. Then the p norm is bounded by the q norm by this claim. Now, now apply Kinchin to the q norm. Now apply the, q is an even integer, right? So now apply this to the q norm. By a factor of two. Yeah, but, this, oh, sorry. So this twiddle, twiddle for me means it, it ignores constant factors. Less than, twiddle, less than twiddle for me means big O. OK, so now we're basically done, because what I can say is, look, this is equal to 4 times, let me write the expectation over uh, sigma s bar as well as sigma prime s of sum over all ij, aij sigma i sigma j prime lp sigma s, sigma prime s bar, right? I just added in a bunch of, I basically just added in the terms that were missing. Which terms are missing? The terms that are missing are where, basically there are four cases. I could either be in s or not in s. J could either be in s or not in s. This sum only contains one of those four cases, where i is in s and j is not in s. I added back all the cases, okay? But I, the other cases that I added back, I added their expectations, but their expectations are zero. This is a prime here, right? Right? Because if, if I added in something that wasn't there before, let's say I added in a case where i was in s, but j was also in s. Then I have aij sigma i sigma j prime, but j is in s. So j. So the expectation over j and s of sigma prime j is 0. So all I did really is I added 0. This is a fancy way of adding 0 on the inside of the norm. But then what am I going to do next? There's one more line left, and then we're really done. Right? What I really want is to have this p norm over sigma and sigma prime. The one word answer. It's a trick we just did. It's Jensen, right? It's the trick, it's this trick, pulling the expectation outside via Jensen. So we're just gonna take this out, pull it out there via Jensen. And this thing is at most four times sum over ij, aij, sigma i, sigma j prime, lp, sigma, sigma prime. That's it. So that's that's the end of the proof. Oh, what, how did I go from here to here? Because, I mean, the reason is they're exactly the same distribution, right? So, so what's going on? There's, my, there's this vector sigma, right? Here is, this is s, and this is the complement of s, right? And what I'm doing is I'm writing, I've, I have this quadratic form where I keep multiplying entries from here with entries of here. Some over, I, some over i here and j here of aij, this number times that number, right? So this is sigma, this is sigma s, 
and this is sigma s bar. And now what I'm saying is, what if I just replace, let's take sigma prime now. This is sigma prime. This sigma prime s, sigma prime s bar, right? If I look at some over ij, where i is an s and j is not an s, of aij sigma i sigma j, if I just took these guys and just like swap them, then, I mean, this is a random sign vector. This chunk here is a random sign vector, a bunch of random signs, independent of these random signs. So if I just replace these by another set of random signs, it's exactly the same distribution, right? I can just replace all of these with another set of random signs, and it's the same thing. So these, these two random variables are equal in distribution. Yeah. 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 Oh, I pulled it. I mean, I guess I was. Maybe I'll. Maybe it's better to just go through it with the definition offline. So basically, p norm is that, right? So if you look at the function f of x, where f of x is equal to the absolute value of x to the p, and p is at least one, that is a convex function. So I was actually applying Jensen to that convex function. So what I had was the absolute value to the p, and on the inside, I had the expectation over eta. And then what I was doing was I was pulling out the expectation over eta outside. And when I pulled the expectation over eta outside, I ended up with this, right, the second line over there, which is, which is the p norm over eta. So yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I guess it's, it, maybe work through it with that definition and you'll see exactly why this was just Jensen. Eta is a, vec a, a bunch of independent Bernoulli one halves. Yeah, so eta i is one with probability half, zero with probability half. Yeah. Okay. Very good. So that's the end of uh, decoupling. So now we can prove Hansen right. And of course, when I initially stated Hansen right, I stated it in terms of a tail bound, but as you know from p set one, it's the same as a bound on all the p norms. So Hansen Wright restated, we want that for all p bigger than or equal to 1, the p norm of sigma transpose a sigma minus the expectation of sigma transpose a sigma is at most root p times the Frobenius norm plus p times the operator norm. That's what we want to show. Right? That's the same thing as that. So let's prove it. So we know that sigma transpose a sigma minus the expectation of sigma transpose a sigma p norm is at most, this twiddle hides constants. In particular, right now, I'm going to hide the constant 4. This is at most sigma transpose a sigma prime, where this is now DLP norm over both sigma and sigma prime. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply Kinchin. By Kinchin, uh, this is decoupling. By Kinchin, this thing is at most the L2 norm of A sigma prime, P norm. Okay. And um, this is Kinchin. And in general, um, right, so actually, and this thing is at most 
uh, you write it like this, a sigma prime L2 norm squared, uh, well actually it's equal to, this thing is equal to, so let's, uh, okay, so we'll show for p bigger than or equal to 2. Again, why, is it, why does it suffice to show it for p bigger than or equal to 2? Because any norm which is between 1 and 2, we can just bound it by the 2 norm, right? Which changes p by most of constant factor for those small p. So this is, if you just look at the definition of p norm, this is actually equal to, look at a sigma prime L2 norm squared, look at the p over 2 norm to the 1 half power. This is just by definition of p norm. So if you, if you just like expand this out to its definition and expand this out to its definition, you'll see that they're exactly the same thing. Okay. Now, I can replace p over 2 norm by p norm because if you increase, a, a p norm is less than a q norm if, b, if p is less than q. Right? So this is at most, A sigma prime L2 norm squared P norm to the 1 half. Okay. Question? This? This? So that was, what we, that was what we just proved, right? That's decoupling. This, this right here is sigma transpose a sigma minus the expectation. That sigma transpose a sigma prime. So that I just I just did decoupling. That's the definition of p norm, right? The p norm. Well, what, what do you mean by that, right? So that's that is decoupling. Yeah. So the p norm, the definition of p norm has the expectation in it. Right? So. And then now I use now I basically I'll subtract the expectation and add it back and use triangle inequality. This is at most the expectation of a sigma prime L2 norm squared. Plus a sigma prime L2 norm squared minus the expectation sigma prime L2 norm squared P norm to the one half. Right? So I just I just added in the expectation and subtracted it out and did triangle inequality. And now this thing is at most in, oh, I, I, I've been losing root p's everywhere. When you apply Kinchin, there's a root p, right? So there's a root p here, there's a root p here, root p. Right. Kinchin says that that linear form is at most root p times the L2 norm. Okay, so there's root p. So this thing now is at most root p times uh, expectation of that thingy plus root p times uh, this. And this is just because, in general, the square root of x plus y is at most root x plus root y. Okay. Now, what is this? Well, I'll just tell you. You can calculate it out, but I'll tell you. This thing just happens to be the Frobenius norm squared of a. So that's a calculation you can do if you want. 
It's not too hard to show though. So this is equal to root p times the Frobenius norm. That looks like progress to me, right? That's the first term that we wanted. That's this, right? So this is, we're proving it's right here. We wanted this root p times Frobenius norm, but we also want p times operator norm. Plus root p times sigma transpose a transpose a sigma minus the expectation of sigma transpose a transpose a sigma. Right. I just replaced sigma prime with sigma, but it doesn't matter because sigma is a random sign vector, sigma prime is a random sign vector. They give you the same norms. Huh. So what do you think we want to do to that? Decouple. Okay, so we'll decouple that. We'll decouple this thingy. Okay. And then we'll apply Kinchin again. Okay. So this thing is at most root p times the Frobenius norm plus this will give us root p times the nor L2 norm of some vector. But that root p is to the 1 half. So it actually is p to the quarter. So p to the quarter plus root p is p to the 3 quarters. So p to the 3 quarters times, <coughs> here we have um, a transpose a sigma L2 norm p to the 1 half. Well, actually, yeah, p to the 1 half. But notice that A transpose, in general, right, in general, well, let me just write it down. This thing is at most root P times Frobenius norm plus P to the 3 quarters times the operator norm of A to the 1 half times A sigma L2 norm P to the 1 half. This is just because, um, you know, mx is at most the operator norm of m times the norm of x. This is basically the definition of operator norm. So if I'm, yeah, so I think we are done. Why are we done? We're done because of the following reason. Call this number, is this visible? This, uh, let's do this. This number here, call it E. Okay? What have we shown? Well, if that's E, what is this number? Right, that's just e squared. So what have we shown? We've shown that root p times e squared is less than twiddle. That loses constant factors. Root p plus times Frobenius norm plus p to the 3 quarters times, eps, times operator norm to the 1 half times e. So less than twiddle just means less than times a constant factor. right? So <coughs> putting that constant factor uh, back, where did my nice chalk go? I guess I used it up a lot. So this implies that um, I can divide every I can divide root p everywhere, right? So I can divide root p, divide this root p here. I get p to the quarter, and what I get is that e squared minus some constant times p to the quarter 
times up norm to the 1 half times e minus some constant times the Frobenius norm is less than or equal to 0. Right? That's what I get. This is a quadratic in E whose leading coefficient is non-negative, right? So this quadratic goes from infinity down back to infinity. And we're saying that it's less than or equal to 0. So it means that we're at a point in this quadratic that's smaller than the larger root. So you just solve the quadratic equation, and then you're basically done, right? So we'll do that, and then we'll finish. So this is the square root trick in action. So this implies that E is at most the larger root of the quadratic equation. And then we know that sigma transpose a sigma minus expectation of sigma transpose a sigma <coughs> was at most e squared, right? Was at most was at most root p times, uh, yeah, was at most root p times e squared, and that will conclude everything. Right, that's what we showed here. We showed that. Sigma transpose a sigma blah, 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 is at most root p times e squared. So now just solve, I mean, now that's it, right? So just solve it. Um, I can do it. I guess we have two minutes. I might as well. But it's nothing complicated at this point. You just solve this quadratic equation, which implies that e is at most uh, cp to the quarter times the operator norm to the half. plus the square root of c squared p root p operator norm plus uh, 4c uh, Frobenius norm over 2. Right? And this thing is at most well, here we have something. So like this thing here, the square root of a squared plus b squared is at most, well, a squared plus b squared is at most twice the max of a squared, the max of a squared and b squared, right? So basically, this thing here up to constants is dominated by the max of the square root of that and the square root of that. So this thing is up to a constant. It's at most p a quarter times Frobenius norm or times operator norm of half plus the square root of the Frobenius norm. Okay? Which implies that root p times e squared is at most uh, root p times the Frobenius norm plus p to the quarter squared is root p times another root p is p times the operator. So that's the proof of Hansen rate. So we're done. Questions? 